Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, it's good to see you here this morning. Aren't you glad to be in here rather than Ooh. out there right this minute? Yes. Uh, and I know we live in the South and we enjoy the South. Amen. I do. I, do. Yep. I enjoy the hot weather, but when it, when it kind of get you know cleaned up a little bit, I don't want to feel so sweaty sometimes. <laughs> so I'm so thankful for air conditioning. And uh, you know, somebody said one time they. You know, Southerners, when it, when the storms come around, we uh, aren't so worried about the you know lights going out and stuff like that. We're just worried about being stuck in the house with no air conditioning. <laughs> Amen. All right, it's good to see you here this morning. It's good to be able to be in a place where we can worship freely, worship, and be able to tell the Lord, give Him our best today. Amen. Whatever that may be, give Him our best in worship today. So let's stand to our feet. And together, let's just welcome the King of Kings because it's His worship service. He is the honored guest today, okay? Father, we love you. We praise you. I thank you, Father God, that I come before a perfect, holy Father today. A perfect, holy God today. Who saw that need long, long, long ago. That there was no way I could ever measure up. So, God, you said, I, I love them so much that I'm going to provide a way that they can come to me freely. That they can trade their robe of sin and unrighteousness for a robe of righteousness. So you said, Jesus. Father, I thank you for that every single day because, Lord, I know. I know the Holy Spirit that you put in me lets me know that I don't measure up. I strive, Lord, I try my best to be better and better, but Father God, I still, at the end of the day, my goodness can never make it. So I pray today, Father, as we're in this worship service to you, that people would be drawn to you because your word says when we are drawn to you, Father, when you are lifted up, you draw people to yourself. So Father, today, draw us. In that drawing, Lord, help us to understand our need for you. Understand our shortcoming without you. And Lord, we don't want to leave this world and open our eyes in a devil's hell. Father, we want to open our eyes in the face of Jesus, in a place with Jesus. So Father, today help us to understand what we need to do to, to make that happen. And Father, to open, us to open our mouths, confess our sin, confess our faith in you, Lord, and then allow you to make the changes in our life. So Father, we welcome you. And this your worship service, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Let's worship him this morning.
Because before you leave this place today, you can know that sweet, sweet forgiveness that Jesus Christ died on a cross for me and for you so that we can have the forgiveness that we all need. Welcome to Open Arms Fellowship. It's so good to see you this morning. Thank you for dropping in, worshiping with us. If you're, excuse me, if you're watching online, thank you for tuning in. If this is your first trip here with us, there should be a card and a chair somewhere in front of you. And you can share some information about yourself, or you can share a prayer request, or you can share some questions about who and what in the world is Open Arms. And this is the place to do it with a card or go to our website and find one in the electronic format. And if you're here, just put it in the offering box right over there against the wall. And we would love to get cards from you. I'd love to get cards. You got one last week? Just keep sending the cards and we'll keep praying for you. This morning in our prayer time, because we have a cool family prayer time together, this morning we're going to do something different because... As most of you kids know, school starts this week. <clears throat> but I'm going to ask all of our teachers and those <laughs> teachers and workers in school, if y'all would just come down here, we want to pray with y'all. Because you're, you're in a battlefield. And so come on, teachers, school workers. You don't have to be a teacher. If you work in the school system, just come on down. We just want to pray with y'all. Whitney, come on down if you can, because I want you involved in this. Where's Whitney? I don't even see his face up there. Somewhere up there. So we got our teachers down here. If you are one of those kids who are going to have to go to school this week, I'm going to ask you to come down here too, because we want to pray for you, kids. Because if you're like me, you're like, I don't want to go to school. You know, so I always needed a prayer for attitude. <laughs> you know, school has, has always been tough, but it's tough. I was sharing with the praise team, and I've shared some others this week. You know, COVID, the first wave scared us. I think this wave is confusing us. It's just confusing. And I don't know that the school system is, is not the place of the most confusion. I, you know, we got to pray for their leaders. But who knows what to do? I mean, it's easy to point fingers, but if you've got to make the choices, what, what do you do? What do you do? And so let's pray over these folks. And I'm asking Alan, who's near who's dear to this, because he's got a wife in the system and he's got kids in the system. I'm going to ask him to pray. And then, I, was, I don't know where Whitney went, but I want to ask Ronnie, who also has a very big heart in the system because he's had a wife and now a daughter and a son in it. I want to ask Ronnie to wrap up the prayer after Alan gets done. Dear Heavenly Father God, thank you so much for the freedom we have to worship you here today. I thank you for these teachers who are on the front line, these children. Uh, God, you revealed to me last week during prayer time that our teachers, even though this seems like the school years last year and even this year, it is more confusing than ever. There's a lot of different variables coming into place, a lot of different things, that, a lot of uncertainty in our school district. A lot of our uncertainty with COVID and everything that's going on, Father God. But you knew all this. You knew all this was going to take place. And I, I, I believe, Father God, that you knew what teachers were going to be where they are. And that you picked them, God, for that mission field. So this morning, Father God, I want you to just wrap your hand of protection around them, Father God. Be in their heart, in their minds, and just comfort them. Give them in such uncertain times. Let them be the words of encouragement. We know that there's kids out there that don't have love, don't have a loving home, and probably more uncertainty in their home. Let those teachers fill that gap for these children, God, and be the bridge between the children and you, Father. 
because there is a lot of things going on that's outside of our understanding, outside of our control. But one thing we can control, Father God, is our relationship with you. So God, let's just make it more in a, in a society that says we need to shut you out. We live in a society where we need you more and more every day. God, we call on your name right now this morning, God, for these children, for these parents that are sending these kids to these in schools and institutions in uncertain times, and for the children themselves, God, just protect them. Keep, your, keep their path straight, God, and just remind them daily, give them the peace and comfort that you're there, that you're always available if we just call on you, Father. God, we cannot do anything on our own and on our own understanding. Through you, all things are possible, Father God. We give this school year to you, Father God. We give these teachers right now and these children. We offer them up to you right now, Father God. And all the uncertainty will go away if we keep our focus on you, Father, and what our mission is in you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Father, I too thank you for being so good, so close to these ones, Lord. Father, your word says we have not because we ask not. So, Lord, we've asked for a lot today. We've asked for a measure of protection for all the teachers and for wisdom for them and for protection over the kids, Lord, as they go into the classroom. But now we ask you too, Father God, for supernatural, supernatural favor, Lord God. Not just protection. Now, I thank you for protection for the teachers, Lord. And Father, there's times whenever they step out of their house, Lord, they're not prepared. Mentally, emotionally, Lord, there's just so much they deal with at home. And they're human beings just like everybody else. And so, Lord, there's just times when they just don't want to get there. Just like we all are in any job. But Lord, I pray that as they take a step forward, God, you're going to take a running step toward them. And Lord, you're going to meet them because, Father, they're not only going to a job, Lord. They're going to a calling, Father. They're going for some direction, Lord. Not only, they're going to, to lift somebody else up. And Lord, yes, it may be their job. They may have no one they sign on to. But God, there's many things in that classroom. Many children they deal with, Lord. Many uh, events that will happen that they didn't sign on for. But God, you're going to give them supernatural wisdom in favor as to how to deal with it. Lord, they'll maybe brushing their hair in the morning. They may be brushing their teeth. They may be putting on their clothes. And all of a sudden, they don't know why some something comes into their mind and why that particular thing is sitting on their mind that day. But when they get to school, they're going to understand what you were working and trying for them already. I've seen it many times, Father God, in my life. Oh, God, I know I don't have the answers. We know that these teachers don't have all the answers. But, God, with you, all things are possible. It don't matter what they encounter. God, I pray for a, a peace that rules over them. Father, God, that they will, even in the face of stuff that they don't know what to do with it, in the back of their mind, they're whispering, Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, give me the wisdom. Holy Spirit, help me to hold my mouth until you tell me what to say. And when I say it, Father God, I prophesy. And I don't just say it. I declare it as what the Lord has said. And Father God, I thank you that you honor your words. You honor your words and you honor your servants, Lord. Thank you again for protecting. Even when all the other mess may be going around, the sickness, Lord, the insecurities. And Lord, yes, for all the stuff that happens at school sometimes. Thank you for protecting this group. Thank you for giving them safety and peace and direction. And Father, I thank you for prospering them. I thank you for prospering them to everything they put their hand to. Every place they put their feet at, Lord, is conquered in the name of Jesus. Because, Lord, you go with them. And we praise you and thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Yes, Lord, you are. Amen. Such a faithful God. Amen. It is well. It is 
can be well with our soul no matter what we're going through. If we just let go and trust in you. Because the waves and winds still know his name. Amen. The waves and winds still know his name. So if the waves and the wind know his name, then don't you think your problems know his name too? Amen. The things that you're going through, your circumstances, they know his name too. And nothing is greater than that name. So if you just speak the name of Jesus over any situation, anything that we're going through, it can be well with your soul. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. So our kids are going out for a party now that they're gone. We got stuff. Oh, and it don't stop there. We got stuff. And then for those people who don't do chocolate stuff, who like that salty crunch, oh, we got, we got stuff. And just in case, you know, you want something good to go with it. We got, we got stuff. We got stuff. So they ain't the only ones going to be talking about and get, well, I don't know if y'all get this food or not. It's awful close to me. I got a head start. And Rhonda saw me running this week, and if I got chocolate in my hand, I can really run. And if somebody's chasing me, I can run even harder because they're trying to get my chocolate. So the students... The kids go back to school this week. And you know it's never just the kids because we all know it affects the whole family. Um, if it was just sending them off, then it would be like, oh, the kids are gone. No, it's, it doesn't work that way, does it? Schedules change. Everything changes. It's just they go back to school. And guess what? Jesus wants to take us back to school as well. We've been in a series called Back to School with Jesus. And Jesus took a group of guys to school. And, and try to remember the setting. If you were here when we first started off, th this is a group of people who are really confused about how to live in their current crazy culture. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> and Jesus had pulled them aside and said, Hey guys, I want you to, to know how to live in this craziness. Because they were confused. They were confused on a government level, because they had the Romans, they had the Jewish government, and they didn't know who to hear, listen to, or who to believe, and so we got some of that. They were confused on a religious level, because they had three different groups who were within the Jewish religion saying, do this, don't do that, follow us, follow them, and, and so there was a lot of confusion. And Jesus steps on the scene, He says, come here guys, I want to, I want to tell you how to live. Jesus was the master teacher, and as he taught these, he taught these in a really cool format that are the same. Every one of them is the same. First, there's a blessing. And oh, we like that. Yeah, oh yeah, blessing. Then there was a way of life. Then there was the reason behind the blessing. So every one we've looked at and the ones we're going to look at, they fall in the same format. A blessing, a way of life, a way to live in this crazy confusion, and then a reason behind the blessing. And so Jesus wants to take us to school today. You know, for over 10 years, I spent almost every day in the big brown truck. I was a UPS guy delivering packages. And, and I really liked the job. Every day was a little bit different out on the road because uh, you know, things changed. But every day was also very similar because UPS hammered in us methods, methods, methods. And one of the methods they always taught us is know your next five stops. Know how you're going to drive into that place. Know how you're going to deliver that package. You just were supposed to know. And so you really didn't even think about it. In fact, they had a, a slogan, if you have to think about it, it's too late. So you're just supposed to know. And so a lot of my routes, a lot of my streets, a lot of my stops were the same every day. And so... I would kind of drift off into some daydreaming because I knew the methods, I knew the stop. But there was a period in there, I don't, imagine, I don't exactly remember when, but there was a period in there where the daydream kind of turned into an obsession. It was an obsession with winning the publisher's clearinghouse giveaway. Yeah, this was, the day, this was before the day of lottery, which, by the way, is a big waste of your money if you do that. But uh, 
I really believe that that was the key to being happy, and that was going to satisfy my life. And and I I, I dreamed, I, I, I obsessed over winning, and I even prayed, Lord, if I win this, you know I'm going to serve you more in the church, and I'm going to do more for you, and my life will be satisfied. And I really believe that. Thought that was the key. Well, I never won it, by the way. <laughs> if I did, I'd share. Maybe. But I don't know. See, the Lord knew. He knew I didn't need it. He knew I'd probably forget all about Him and the church and be so self-absorbed with my money and doing what I wanted to do with my money. And so He knew not to give it to me. If the Lord knew that all that money and all that stuff truly satisfied me, he'd have no problem giving me all that I could spend and all I could ever want. But, but he knew, and I'm still learning, because it's still a temptation sometimes, but now I recognize it's a temptation that draws me away from what really satisfies me. You know, we all love the smell of that new car until we have to make that first payment. <laughs> We all love the new. We want something different. We want to go somewhere different. We want to have something different. And, and there's nothing wrong with having new in and of itself. The problem comes when we attach purpose and meaning and value to those things. When, when we think that our car, our house, our clothes, our trips, or whatever define us, make us more important. That's when we've we come to a place that we're trying to make those things into something they were never intended to be. You know, whether you got a new car or an old beater, you know, it's just a car. It's, it's just a car. <laughs> and we need cars most of the time. And there's nothing wrong with having them. But if, I, if my value, my purpose, my meaning is found in a car, then I've created that car into something it was never meant to be. Same way with a person. We're supposed to love people. We're supposed to care about people. But as soon as we start placing our value, our purpose, our meaning in, in people, we've turned them into something they were never intended to be. I've seen it. Maybe you have. A, a mother who, who loses direction in life and purpose and meaning when her kids grow up and leave home because she had placed all her value in those kids. Maybe you've seen the couples. I have, and I've had them in my office sometime talking to them. Couple, everything seemed okay, but when the kids grew up and moved off, they got divorced. Why? Because they didn't have a relationship and they had all their value and purpose and meaning in the kids. And, and when we take any kind of stuff, whether it's the world's stuff, or whether it's a person, and we try to put our value, purpose, meaning, and try to find satisfaction in, in them, we've turned them into something they were never intended to be, and, and we are not satisfied with it. Which made me think about the question today. What truly satisfies us? What truly satisfies you? Now, I know this is kind of a big question because, you know, we like satisfied here in the stomach, you know. Y'all think about lunch. Y'all want to go get something. I mean, some of y'all want to rush the stage. You want to be, we want to be satisfied in our stomach. We, we like to be satisfied right here, don't we? Oh, man, you know, satisfied in my finances. How much more do I have to have? How much more? I, I still remember the phrase from, uh, I think it was Mr. Rockefeller. Somebody said, how much is enough money. And he said, one more dollar. One more dollar. We like to be satisfied in our jobs. We like to be satisfied in our relationships. So what does it take to be satisfied? Well, at the end of the day, when we lay our head on a pillow, or even the bigger picture, at the end of our life, when we say those last words, what would have needed to take place? What would we have to have accomplished? Or what would we have had to acquire to be able to say, oh yeah, that was a satisfying day. That was a satisfying life. Hmm. What if there was a way to be filled forever? 
filled up, satisfied, filled forever. What if it was an infomercial, too, for nineteen ninety nine? But it was real. Something that was offered to us that would fill us forever. Satisfied. Totally. Forever. You know, God made the world perfect. And He made perfect people. Adam and Eve, they were perfect. Everything was, everything was beyond good. But He also made them with the ability to choose, just like you and I have the ability to choose. And He knew the path that we would choose, and so He had a plan. And His plan was Jesus Christ. And you know, Jesus came and put His life on display. It, 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 we, we should focus so much on the cross and the grave, but we can never not focus on the three years that He put His life on display. Because Jesus lived a life of total satisfaction. We never see Him worried. We ne never see Him fearful. We never see Him scrambling for something more. He was totally satisfied. He was full forever because he was seeking something. And he says it so many times, the will of the Father, the will of the Father. And he sought the will of the Father all the way to the cross. And even when the cross and the grave looked like he had really messed up and lost it all, oh, three days later, <laughs> it proved, oh, he was satisfied. Because he came back to life. Alive. Let's thank him for it. And let's pray as we look at this passage today. Lord, there are so many things, stuff, that grab our attention. In fact, Lord, the truth is we're probably so consumed with the stuff of this world, it's hard for us to look past this stuff to to stuff that will really satisfy. And Lord, as I've looked through these Beatitudes and we've begun this journey, I don't know that there's one that's more important for us right now in our current culture than this one. And so, Holy Spirit, take us to school. Teach us that in you and only in you, will we be filled forever. Nothing else. In you and only in you. Filled forever. Amen. So Jesus, sitting on the side of a hill, talking to the twelve and others, who were confused about how to live in this crazy life, said these words in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. If you don't have a Bible that you can read and understand, you let me know. We'll get you one before the day is over. Jesus said this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for God's approval. They will be satisfied. There's our word again, blessed. If you haven't been with us, this word blessed here means Blessed beyond the normal. Blessed beyond God's normal blessings. This is superhero status kind of blessings, folks. Superhero. The kind of stuff we see on movies, but this is real. And Jesus says you can be superhero blessed. It's coming for those who hunger and thirst for God's approval. Hunger and thirst... Really, those two words are words that most of us really don't know the true depth of their meaning. Because the two words that Jesus chose to use that day on the side of the hill, the word for hunger means to suffer, suffer from not having food over a long period of time. The word he used for thirst it means to, to, to be just at a point of hurting because you haven't had anything to drink. This is the kind of stuff most of us have only seen in pictures like in Africa and other places. Now, most of us, we've experienced a little hunger. You know, we've missed a couple of meals. 
Most of us know what it's like when our stomach growls because we, we've been so busy we didn't stop and eat or we was having so much fun we didn't stop and eat. Most of us know what it's like to be thirsty. We want that cold glass of Mountain Dew, Dr. Pepper, because we're thirsty. But most of us really don't know the, the depth of what God, Jesus was talking about this day to where we're suffering for it. But the whole concept that Jesus is teaching we do know because what Jesus is talking about here is that there should be such a longing for, a hunger, a thirst, a desire. Now we know about desire. In fact, that's usually our struggle. Our struggles is not out of need, but it's out of want. <laughs> we understand desire for things. And so I brought some of the things most of us desire. We desire these things. Most of us will stop in a convenience store to get these things that we know we shouldn't even be getting. Most of us get a hold of this stuff and can't put it down. I got proof of that because this is the second bag I bought for the Sunday service. <laughs> it ain't been open yet. You know what happened to the first bag? One wasn't enough. Two wasn't enough. Three wasn't enough. My man Billy, he's upstairs. My man Billy, he, he really likes some Hershey Kisses. Now, he don't like them with the nuts in them and don't put the caramel in He just wants the good old Hershey Kisses and he's, he's got some about all the time. And some of you, you just about fight me over a bag of Reese's. Man, those like that creamy chocolate and that one-of-a-kind peanut butter and that, ooh. And those minis, if you had those minis, those things are just wrong because you just got to eat like the whole bag. I mean, you can't just eat one of those minis. You just got to... And then these things, I mean, really, Lay's had it right. Who can eat just one chip? I mean, when's the last time uh, all y'all sat around as a family and watched a movie while chunking on celery? Not. I mean, people opened up these things and they don't stop till it's out. It's gone. And then those soft drinks. Oh, man. I actually had in my first church a lady who didn't eat all day long. She lived on a two-liter Mountain Dew or a two-liter Dr. Pepper. True story. Or maybe throw in some Little Debbie's. Oh, yeah. Greatest creation known to man, right? <laughs> See, we, we know desire. We even know some of the feelings that are coming up when we're looking at these because we want them. We know desire. We know desire because we'll... We, you know what? We will actually stop. We'll come off the interstate and add 30 to 45 minutes to our trip just to get something we're not even supposed to have. Why? Because we want it. We have a desire. That's the heart behind what Jesus was saying. So let's take it back to the verse again. What did he say? He said, blessed, superhero blessed, are those who hunger and thirst, desire for God's approval. So, so we know this drive in our stomach. You know, we will even go out of our way and go after things that we know are not even good for us. Now we do that in our stomach, but we also do that in life, don't we? We do that in our finances. We'll go after stuff and get a big old debt, even though we know it's really not good for us. We'll go after that in our relationships. We'll do whatever we can to track down that person, even if we know it's not good for us. We are driven by desire. And Jesus, teaching this group of people who really didn't know what to do in life, says, guys, I want you to take that drive, I want you to take that desire, and I want you to focus it on something. God's approval. 
approval. Now, that's a big, big thing in our culture right now. In fact, I think it's, it's probably one of the biggest things in our culture right now in my entire lifetime. We have a culture of people who are seeking approval. Even the hardest headed person who says, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. Not it's not true. We're seeking approval. All humanity is seeking the approval of something or someone a step higher than they are. Just go to YouTube. Just on your Twitter. Look at your TikTok. What do people want? They want likes. They want subscription. They want you saying that you like them. You approved of what they just did. We're hungry for approval. I think that's what's behind all this sexual identity crisis. It's a hunger for approval. I think that's what's going on in all the rebellion we're seeing in t cities like Portland and Atlanta. They're seeking the approval of someone. Look at what I'm doing and approve of it. We're a culture that is obsessed with approval. Even though we want to deny it, we don't care what anybody thinks about us, the truth is we're hungry for approval. And many people, okay, most people, would do radical stuff to get approval. Jesus, sitting on the side of a hill, talking to 12 guys and probably some more, said, guys, I want you to get radical. I want you to get hungry and thirsty. I want you to get driven by your desires. I want you to do it no matter what it takes, no matter what you've got to overcome. I want you to have it, want it, go for it, no matter what. God's approval. Oh, God's approval? Yeah, God's approval. Take that same drive, that same desire, that same hunger, and funnel it towards getting God's approval. Now, we need to understand what he means by God's approval right here. Jesus was not talking about the approval of salvation at this point, okay? The only way we can have God's approval for salvation in heaven and the forgiveness of their sin is through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Only way. But what Jesus was talking about in this passage was our everyday life actions. He was talking about the way we talk, the way we think, the way we act. And he's saying, guys, I want you to funnel those desires. I want you to funnel those hungers. I want you to, I want you to run after God's approval like a hungry man would for food. I want you to run after God's approval like a thirsty man would for water. I want you living in this crazy world seeking God's approval more than anything else. Let that be the driving force of your life. That every day you wake up, your number one goal of the day, God's approval. Every day you lay down your head on a pillow and you say, oh, what a day it was because I know I did what God wanted me to do. That's what Jesus is talking about in his passage. He's talking about the way we live every day. And are we seeking his approval? Sadly, most of us can... Um, share some scars of seeking the approval of friends when we were in high school. We got some pain of trying to seek the approval of a friend or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Most of us know somebody who, who lost their marriage and lost their family because they were seeking the approval of a boss or a corporation and they became a workaholic and forgot all about them. Most of us will forget about God's approval and join in that dirty little joke at work or start talking bad about somebody and their misfortunes or bashing that political person while ignoring what God would want us to say and do. See, we, we seek the approval of people. And Jesus knew it would be a driving force in our lives and he's saying, guys, I want you to channel that driving force. But this is where I want you to channel it, to seek God's 
approval. I think if there was a step one, step two, step three in this one little verse, I think the first step would be that we get honest and real about the fact that we're seeking approval from something or someone somewhere. We really are. And I know, especially us guys, we brush it off. I don't care what anybody thinks. That's not true. When we get down, way down in here, we're seeking somebody's approval. We want somebody to recognize the good job we've done. We want somebody to hear our thoughts. Jesus said, yeah, I know. <laughs> and you got this desire, this driving desire. Channel it to seek God's approval. Now, Jesus wasn't just sharing empty words that day because Jesus was putting on display and He's put on display for us in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a life seeking God's approval. Seeking, not again, we're not talking about salvation approval. Jesus didn't need that. He's perfect. We're talking about doing the things God wants us to do approval on a daily basis. Jesus, if you look at His life, you see it so many in the, in the Scriptures. The will of the Father. The will of the Father. Look, when, he's, when somebody said, Hey, Jesus, teach us how to pray. What did Jesus say when He was teaching them how to pray? Your Father, Your will be done. What was He? He was hungry for the will of the Father. Think about Jesus in the garden that night before He would take His... Go, before he would go to the cross. And he's struggling. He's struggling with what he's about to face tomorrow. What does he say? Not my will. Father, your will. He's hungry. He's striving. He wants the will of the Father. He wants the Father's approval in his actions. And even on the cross, just before he takes his last breath for a while, some of his words, Father, forgive them. Seeking what the Father wants. Seeking what the Father wants. Now hear me well. Don't hear something I don't say. Hear me well. Jesus did not go to that cross just for me and you. Jesus went to that cross seeking the will, the approval of the Father. Because if we're not careful, we romanticize what Jesus did. We say, Jesus did it for me. Jesus did do it for us. But that wasn't the primary drive in Jesus' life. And if we miss the primary drive in Jesus' life, we won't have the primary drive in our life. And Jesus' primary drive was the will of the Father. I want the Father's approval. I want to do what the Father wants me to do. Which, oh, by the way, included the cross, which, by the way, was for our benefit. <laughs> But that was not his drive. His drive was the Father. Just look at his life. It was all about the Father. And so Jesus isn't just on the side of the hill telling these guys, guys, you need to do this. He's saying, guys, this is the way I'm doing it. I'm living this way. I want the will of the Father. I want to seek the Father's approval. Why would a group of fishermen who seem to have an apparent successful fishing business, walk away from it and follow a man named Jesus. Why would a tax collector who I'm sure was making a lot more money than when he left the tax business give it all up and follow Jesus? Because there was a desire, there was a hunger, there was a seeking of more of an approval from someone else. And so they gave it up. They got radical. And Jesus is saying, guys... I want you to give it up. I want you to give up seeking all this other stuff that's never really going to satisfy you and I want you to follow after my example and go all out to seek the will of the Father. You know, Jesus did it till it killed Him. Whoa, really? Yeah. Jesus sought the will of the Father so much till it killed Him. Did this work, verse work for him? Because what did the rest of the verse say? Blessed, that's super blessed, 
or those who hunger and thirst for God's approval, they will be satisfied. Did this verse work for Jesus? Oh, yeah. Because three days later, he came back to life. <laughs> and where's Jesus right now? He's at the highest position, at the right hand of the Father, seated on the throne. And he's awaiting for the day when all of creation hears the Father say, King of kings, Lord of lords. Woo! What a verse. Jesus lived it out, and he's going to experience every bit of that satisfaction. Blessed are those who hunger, desire, are driven by the Father's approval, they will be satisfied. Interesting word, satisfied here. Most of us have really never experienced this level of satisfaction that Jesus was talking about here because the word Jesus used for satisfied meant to be totally, completely satisfied not wanting anything. Wow. I don't know about you, but those moments haven't happened in my life like that very often. You get one of these, what do you want? Another one. You get two of these, what do you want? Another one. They don't satisfy. Oh, for a moment they satisfy. When you're in your mouth, then they're gone. You want another one. It's not just food either. It's our finances. It's our relationships. It's our stuff. Angie and I have been um, tremendously blessed this year from a difficult event. Her dad died in January. And, and before we even got there, her family had decided to give me his 2015 F-150. And it's a nice truck. And, and I've thanked God for it so many times. And most of the time when I get in it, I thank the Lord for it. But I'll be honest with you, I've, I've thought about what it would be like to have an F-250 or an F-350. And we were blessed that her mom just recently gave us inheritance as she did for all three of the kids and she wanted to go ahead and give it so we could she could see how we enjoyed it and we went and bought the 05 motor home and man I like our motor home we did the full living in it just last week and I can't wait for the house to sell and we'll move into it but um I'll be honest with you this week I went and looked online at the 2022 motor homes and man are they nice you see this stuff just don't satisfy there's something better. There's something bigger. There's something nicer. And there's something about us that are driven. We're driven to, to that next thing because that last thing really didn't satisfy. But Jesus is saying, I got something that will fill you forever. Not just when you're dead and gone, fill you forever. And that is the hunger and the thirst for God's approval. So, so what, do we, what do we do with this? It's a cool sounding concept, Jesus, but really, what do we do with this today? What do we do with this on Sunday? What do we do with this going to work Monday and kids going back to school? How, how do we do this? Remember, he's talking about the approval of our actions. What are we going to do to make the Lord happy? You know, it's interesting, most of us, will work harder to make someone happy with us when that person's watching us. I know when I was a kid and I was doing something with my dad or for my dad, I wanted to do a really good job because I was in front of daddy and daddy was watching and I wanted daddy to say, hey, good job. You know, somebody's watching, the boss is watching, we, we kind of pick it up a little bit, don't we? What if we really faced the rest of this day and tomorrow and all week long that God is watching? Because He is. <laughs> but what if that became a new reality? What do we do with this? What if, if one of the things we went into this new week, because we got a new week starting today, what if this week we just determined we were going to be more 
more aware of the reality that God was watching every moment. When we were alone in front of that phone, and nobody else was watching. Oh, God's watching. When we were in the house with our spouse and our temper was rising and nobody else could hear what we were going to say to Oh, God, God's watching. When we at work and, you know, we need a little extra money or we need a little extra stuff that the company has plenty of, we can take that. Nobody's watching. God, right? God's watching. What if we just took this passage and if nothing else, we just became more aware that, that He's watching? <laughs> what else can we do with this? Well, you know, it's really hard to seek the approval of someone when we don't know what they expect of us. I don't know, maybe you've been on a job before, they really didn't give you good training, they just kind of stuck you out there and you're like, I don't know what to do. And you just kind of do stuff and, I mean, you feel kind of helpless, hopeless and don't know whether you're doing a good job or not. If, if our hunger, if our desire is supposed to be to, to seek God's approval, then, you know, we should have a hunger and a desire to know what He approves of. <laughs> We should have a hunger and a desire to know what God said, how God said to live in this crazy world because He laid it out for us right here. I, personally, I'm in a journey through Exodus and I'm amazed at how clear God told the children of Israel, this is what I want you to do. I mean, He went to great lengths to be very clear. This is what I want you to wear. This is what I want you to do when you come before me and worship. I mean, details. There was no lack of information. <laughs> we have no lack of information on what God wants us to do. None of us do. We have them here written. We have them on our phones. We can listen to it on a car radio and a preacher's preaching or a song's playing. Those are the things that seek God's approval. We've got to know it. We've got to know He's watching. Here's the last thing I think we can do with this. We've got to hunger and thirst for the voice of the Holy Spirit. You see, He is God with us. He is God now. We're not, none of us are going to see Jesus walking in the subway today because Jesus physically is not hanging out here. But He said, hey, it's better for you if I go because I'm going to send my Spirit. And His Holy Spirit is here. And one of His main jobs is to guide us into all truth. Guide us into what seeks God's approval. <laughs> And He's talking to us. But are we listening? Do we even know what His voice is like? Do we even care? What do we do with this? I think we hunger and thirst for God's presence. To just know. He's watching. Not watching to zap us, but watching because He loves us so much. Watching because He cares about us so much. Watching because He don't want us to fall flat on our face and have the pain and the misery of trying to seek the approval of other people. He don't want us going into deep debt, trying to find satisfaction in this stuff that's not going to last long. He's watching us because He loves us. And He's saying, hey guys, I told you, here it is. Would you, would you just hunger and thirst? For, for how you're supposed to live in life. And then we just listen to His Holy Spirit who says, yeah, do this, don't do that. Go that way, don't go that way. Blessed, superhero style, are those who take that drive, that desire, that hunger, that thirst and channel it for God's approval. They are going to have everything fulfilled, filled forever. You know, we have choices to make. Before this day is over, we have choices to make. And we will make those choices based on our desires. None of us will choose to go eat in a restaurant that we don't want to eat in and eat food that we don't want to eat. <laughs> No, we would choose because it's something we like. It's our desire. 
How much are we driven by a desire for, for God's approval? What choices will we make to seek His approval and be really satisfied?